Have you ever dreamed of exploring another world? Could you witness something new? Push boundaries? Or reach for your greatest hope? The experience of every generation is yours. On the History Channel, where the past comes alive. Ah, the call of the open road. Nothing satisfies that urge like a motorcycle. Join me today as I build a state-of-the-art American touring bike, the Goldwing. I'll work from the frame to the engine to the final coat of paint, and in the process, put my hands on history and my hand on the throttle. Hazelton, welcome to Hands-On History. When it comes to modern touring motorcycles made in America, no name is more legendary than the Goldwing. It's so durable, so comfortable, yet so agile that it holds the Guinness World Record for the longest motorcycle trip. And let's face it, touring is what a luxury motorcycle is all about. Good looks count, of course, but it's how a bike handles over the long haul that makes it worth its $20,000 price tag. Why not just get a car, you ask? Well, no romance, no bad boy mystique, and no open air freedom. Honda's Goldwing combines that open air freedom with some very practical features. A powerful six cylinder engine that easily hauls hundreds of pounds and lasts for 200,000 miles. A ride that's frequently compared to a Barca lounger. Features like air conditioning, foot warming vents, cruise control, and a stereo sound system. In fact, the Goldwing has all the creature comforts of a fine touring automobile. Think two-wheeled Lincoln Town Car with a drop top. To find out how this classic has held the road in its top-of-the-line status for three decades, I visited Honda's Marysville, Ohio manufacturing plant. They've been building Goldwing since 1979, and from the looks of things, they found a fair market right here in Ohio. They've agreed to give me a first-hand look at the nuts and bolts construction of a 2004 GL 1800. Just as a human body needs a skeleton, a motorcycle needs a frame. In this case, an aluminum alloy frame. In a series of vinyl curtain stalls that protect the rest of the factory from the flying sparks and blinding light of aluminum welding, welders join the frame together. Now this is where the frame gets its start. And the Goldwing frame is aluminum. It's made up of cast aluminum pieces like this and extruded aluminum pieces like this one. Typically, they form a joint such as this, and the weld would happen right here. But welding aluminum is more difficult than welding steel because aluminum doesn't turn cherry red when it gets hot. That makes it nearly impossible to see when aluminum is nearing the melting stage. In fact, welder's eye shields make it difficult to see much at all. But without the shields, the worker's retinas would be burned by the blinding white light. Once the frame is completely welded, any stray bits of metal are sanded off. So this is fresh from the welding now? Yeah, it, it's still warm. Okay. We're going to sand this whole area here, make sure you can feel the little stuff on it. Okay. We're going to come up here, clean up this area, because that's where they put their labels on. After a few minutes of sanding, the frame is as smooth as glass. And it's ready for one of the many tests the bike will go through before it's finished. After all the welding and all the heat distortion, we want to make sure these engine mounts are going to fit the engine. As you can see, she's all right. And on the other side, you're going to do the same thing, except it fits in. That tells you right there that frame is going to be a good one. If I, gonna, you know, now you know you're going to have a good fit between yeah. the frame and the engine. If that don't fit, it's crap. Once he's sure he has a good fit, Donald Boyer does a little chiropractic work on the frame. Now what happens over here? This is reform. After all the after all the welds are welded, 
All the heat distortion bends all your parts slightly. So we put it over here, and then we bend it to where it's straight. That way your motorcycle goes straight down the road. This is like an alignment machine. That's exactly so you're right. You're actually bending the metal here. Uh-huh. Right here, right here. Here and here? Yep, yeah, ready? There we okay. go. Next, the frame is powder coated, a painting technique that heats powdered paint into a gel, which dries into a smooth, hard finish. Well, our frame's just been powder coated. Right now, what's happening is that they're stamping a vehicle identification number on the frame. From here, it'll get a few bushings put in, then go over for a wiring harness. The wiring harness is to a motorcycle frame what nerves and blood vessels are to a skeleton. Before long, we'll flesh out the frame with sexy curves molded from lightweight, durable plastic. The cowling, the fairings, and more than 30 other parts are made by injection molding in this form furnace. The parts look like something from a toy model car kit, only much bigger. I do the trimming not with a razor blade, but a pair of side cutters. I see, so this still, it's still a little bit pliable at this point. Yeah, it's pretty soft for a while. It's and this terrible. is where the plastic actually enters yeah. the mold right here. What's too small for the side cutters gets sanded away. That's good. The plastic parts are hooked together to form bigger units, like the cowling, which supports the windshield and the instrument panel. At this point, the plastic pieces look more like modern art mobiles than parts of motorcycles. This is the part that we just uh, sanded over in plastics right now. It's going to get pre-treated here, right? And then it goes off to the professionals for some paint. The paint spraying is strictly for professionals. These paints are so sensitive that even wearing the wrong kind of deodorant can cause a chemical reaction that would ruin the candy apple red paint job. During a long trip down the paint line, each part receives three coats of urethane paint. The last stop is an oven, where the paint is baked to a hard finish. After an hour and a half in the bake oven, the paint job is complete. As a matter of fact, here's the part that I sanded. There are 36 individual painted parts on a Honda Goldwing. Now that we've made the body parts, they need to be assembled. Cindy Storer shows me how to bolt together the flared out fairings of our Goldwing. And this is the front fairing. They give the bike a smooth outline that reduces the drag, making for a faster, smoother ride. And that's right down here. You want to shoot right on this side. Right through here. Straight across. You want to hit the middle one first. There you go. It seems easy enough. That is until I start wrestling with the plastic. Turn right around? <laughs> yeah. And in this plant, there's no margin for error and very little for lost time. Fortunately, Cindy is off the main assembly line. How much time do I have to do this? Oh, you take all the time you want to. As long as you're doing it, I'm not. You sure you gave me the right bolt? Let me see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the production line is already behind because of me. No, we're way ahead. We're all right. Thank goodness. Well, you did great on Thank these. You. Wonderful. Once the fairing is together, the headlight assembly goes in. Just kind of throw them in there. She even lets me sign my extremely limited edition. <laughs> there you go. Well, the frame, the wiring, and the plastic body parts are all well underway. When we return to Hands-On History, I'll get to the heart of the matter, the engine. Specifically, the 118 horsepower, 1800 cubic centimeter Titan that puts the wing in gold wing. The modern touring motorcycle is the height of luxury. Cushy seat, built-in luggage, fairing, stereo, plenty of power, yet very agile. But back in 1885, when the first motorcycle was invented, it was just a four-stroke engine mounted on a wooden bicycle frame. A German engineer by the name of Gottlieb Daimler attached a four-stroke piston engine to a bicycle frame, and the first two-wheeled gasoline engine transportation was born. 
but there were still a few problems to solve. During its first trip of whopping six miles long, the engine set fire to the rider's seat. It took another 15 years of trial and error, including experiments with rotary engines and asymmetrical design, before motorcycles began replacing horses in the early 20th century. During World War I, the motorcycle sprouted a third wheel and an attachment, the sidecar. Now the driver could comfortably bring along a passenger plus baggage. This sprawling concept was pared down a half a century ago when Harley Davidson came out with bikes which had enormous engines, oversized windshields, and plenty of storage in the form of saddlebags and travel trunks. Finally, biking was comfortable. In 1974, Honda introduced a bike built for the long haul, the Gold Wing. Owners loved the cycle's size and power, and they made up for the lack of fairings and saddlebags by adding their own. Within a few years, Honda added these features to the basic bike and managed to grab the lion's share of the touring market. They opened their first American plant in 1979 in Marysville, Ohio. And over the next 20 years, they cranked out tens of thousands of gold wings. The bikes got steadily bigger and beefier. Since then, what are some of the changes that have, have happened to the gold wing? The, the biggest changes that I can remember is, is engines. They've went from, you know, the original started out at 1,000 cc. This one here is an 1,100. Then they went to a 1,200 cc engine. Then they went to a, a 1,500 six, six cylinder engine. And now we're up to an 1,800 six. Six cylinders is two cylinders more than the average compact car. For an 800-pound motorcycle, that's a lot of muscle, nearly 120 horses, powering a machine that weighs less than some ponies. Building the engine is an intricate precision process performed by a team of expert technicians. In just one day, they assemble as many as 200 six-cylinder engines entirely by hand. Like the frame, the engine is aluminum, except for the stainless steel sleeves that surround the pistons. The stainless steel, which is heavier and heats more slowly than aluminum, acts as a buffer and helps dissipate heat. It holds up longer under the wear and tear of churning pistons, too. Within the engine, the connecting rods transform the up and down motion of the pistons into the spinning motion of the crankshaft. When the throttle is wide open, the crankshaft reaches several thousand RPMs. This is where two halves become a whole, huh? Exactly. Andy Thrush assembles the block, making sure the pistons slip into the cylinders. Wow. Next comes the transmission with all six gears, including a reverse gear, which is almost unheard of on a motorcycle. Then the clutch, the alternator, the water pump and the starting motor, the timing chain, and the camshafts, plus belts, hoses, and wiring. This hand-built engine is famous for its precision and durability. To make sure it lives up to its reputation, Joyce Zirkel checks its vital signs. So this, this is the first time the engine has run since it's been put together. You just started it up, right? Run. Here. Yeah, run her up to speed. Wow. Now what, are you, what are we looking at over there? Well, around 2,500. Is that, is that the cruising what? RPM, like 2,500? This is so quiet. Smooth. Of course, that's what it should be, right? Right. So, do you ride a bike? Uh huh. Kind of seriously? Six. What kind? 97 gold wing. What do you call it? Casper. Casper? Why is that so fast? It disappears and you can't see it? <laughs> Good <thing. laughs> This particular engine is perfect. So, what do you think about this one? It's good. That means it's ready to become part of a gold wing. Back on the main assembly line, dozens of frames are queued up near the ceiling, waiting to swing down and join up with an engine. So, Don, this is where you marry up the frame and the engine, huh? Right. 
So you're primarily, what are you primarily concerned about here? Looks like uh, a lot of cables you got to deal with. Routing on the cables and the uh, fuel lines. So you're, it's interesting, you're kind of setting the, setting the frame down on, onto the engine. Onto right? the engine. Yeah. Once the engine is properly mounted, I use an impact driver to bolt it in place. Now we have a frame and an engine, but they aren't going anywhere without a set of wheels. And the wheels, like the rest of the bike, have come a long way from Daimler's 1885 motorcycle with its clunky wood spoke wheels. These beauties are an aluminum magnesium alloy with Dunlop radials made specifically for the Goldwing. Putting the wheels on seemed like it would be one of the easier tasks. After all, I've changed tires before. So I did my best imitation of a pit crew member and jumped right in. Boy, that's kind of tight up in there. Yeah, huh? It's a little hard for a while. Jeez, I can't even reach in there. I can't get it on! <laughs> Is that, oh, no wonder, I was putting it on backwards. Ah, see, that's the trouble. Put, it's better if you put the hole onto the stud, you know? On a typical shift, skilled workers can assemble a tire on this rear swing arm assembly in two minutes flat. <laughs> However, I'm not one of those workers. Once the wheel's assembled, it's taken over to the assembly line and mounted on the back of the gold wing. Now that the front wheel is on, all these parts are starting to look like a motorcycle if not quite yet a gold wing. For that, we'll have to flesh it out with the body parts I helped mold and assemble. Well, our bike's got the basics. From here on down the line, it's gonna get fenders, tank, a cowling, all those things that give it that Honda gold wing personality. It's a high-speed precision assembly line that seems almost symphonic in its split-second timing. A bike moves through here every minute and a half, and there's no time for fumbling. Now grab the gas cap up there. Yeah, just kind of like pull it down in there. Yeah, okay, there you go. Okay. Despite my proven ability to slow down an assembly line, James Fitch lets me pop in the fuel tank. The original 1975 Goldwing had a dummy fuel tank that held a kickstart, electrics, and a storage space. The real fuel tank was under the seat, just like this one. Lots of motorcycles rely on gravity to get gas to the cylinders, but that can lead to an inconsistent fuel feed. So Honda's fuel tanks contain an internal electronic fuel pump to ensure a more even flow. The saddlebag provides enough wardrobe space to outfit several days of long distance touring. Named for the leather bags that cowboys slung over their horses, the Goldwing saddlebag isn't really a bag. It's a 42-liter compartment made of waterproof, impact-resistant plastic. Finally, the Goldwing is assembled, everything but the seat, which will be added at another warehouse. There's not enough room on this assembly line to even store the cushy, oversized seats, let alone attach them. The bike must now face a final test, the dynamometer and its Dynamaster, Chuck Handel. Hey, Chuck. Hi. So what's going to happen here? I'm going to uh, place the unit on the dyno. All right, you want to just go ahead and I'll just kind of tell me, walk me through it as okay. you do it? Sure can. Yeah. Now I'm checking the function of the left turn signal. Make sure it works on the meter and the lights are working. I'm checking the right turn signal. Okay, now I'm ready to roll. Now you're actually turning, are you, is the engine driving the rear wheel now? The engine's driving the rear wheel. Yeah, the wheels are turning freely. And the front wheel is being turned by the rollers. Right, okay, now I'm gonna take the unit up to 25. You're driving down the highway now. I'm driving down the highway now. Okay, now I'm 25, I look up here and I'm getting the speed aware, the difference in the speedometer to your tires. I'm going up to 60. 60 miles an hour. There's a slight difference between the speedometer reading and the actual tire speed, but it's well within tolerance. And I'm getting the difference between the 60 on the speedometer and what the bike is actually going now. 
I'm setting the cruise, making sure when you pull the clutch, it releases the cruise. 75. You're flying. Come flying along. Now I'll take it down to four, set it again to make sure it works. This time I'm going to do the cell down. I'm also listening to the motor to make sure there's no noises, no vibration in the unit. You got the best job in the plant. Oh, you got to love it. It's a lot of fun. 75 miles an hour all day long. 75 miles an hour, never get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the dynamometer gives the bike a thumbs up, but the dyno doesn't have the final word. Oh, it will tell me on the brakes if the brakes aren't functioning right. The rest of it's just, it's, it's you doing it. You listening, you feeling. All right, the human factor. The human you factor. can't get rid of this, despite the fact that you're really automated here, and you are. Ultimately, the final test and check on this bike is up to a human being to do it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to know I still have the edge over a computer. A quick spin convinces me that my Goldwing rides just like it should, like a fast and agile easy chair. explored the history, craftsmanship, and components of my favorite two-wheel machine. But what interests me most is what's up ahead, specifically what's around that next bend in the highway. I'm Ron Hazelton. Thanks for watching Hands-On History.